Hello and a warm welcome to Political Capital. I'm Karabole Tata. This is your intersection of money and politics. And those two elements met this week in Cape Town following countless requests for accountability of South Africa's biggest corporate scandal. Marcus Eustace, the former CEO of Steinhoff, showed face to face the wrath of members of parliament. And also on this show, who gets to cross-examine whom? That is the question laying before the Zondo Commission looking into allegation of state capture in South Africa. But first, let's do a quick recap. Who has implicated whom? The big question this week, who will be cross-examining who? We have seen six witnesses at the State Capture Commission in Johannesburg. Two came to give expert testimony. The other four came to reveal evidence that implicated others. The first was the former Deputy Finance Minister and he implicated Ajay Gupta and his wingman, the former President's son, Duduzani Zuma, as well as a Gupta fixer, Fana Longwane. All three men applied to cross-examine Jonas's testimony to the inquiry and this was his claim. He also said that I w if I worked with them, I would become very rich and that he could immediately offer me 600 million. He pointed at Mr. Duduzani and said that they made, they had made him a billionaire and that he had bought a house in Dubai. He said that they worked closely with a number of people, including Lynn Brown and Brian Molife. As a result, they were, they were protected. While well, Brian Molefi, the erstwhile head of Transnet, has not come out with intent to cross-examine, Former Public Enterprises Minister Lynn Brown is not going down without a fight or a question. She is gunning for Jonas. Fakey mentor, followed with a lengthy testimony touching on aspects some questioned if they were relevant to the hearings. But she implicated former President Jacob Zuma's chief of staff, Lakela Kaunda, and Dudizani as the fixer of the meeting. She alleges she was offered a job by one of the Gupta brothers at their Saxonwald home. But the former ruling party backbencher claimed that the former president was at the residence and walked her out after she refused the Gupta job offer. There are likely to be many more questions, but the former president himself doesn't feel compelled to cross-examine. Then former GCIS CEO Temba Masejo talked to the witness stand and said he met with the Guptas at the behest of Zuma. Masejo told the commission that Ajay Gupta asked him to spend the 600 million GCIS media budget to prop up the now defunct Gupta-owned New Age newspaper. He says, James, that's what they called me at the time. Mm -hmm. Everybody called me that. <laughs> I hear that you are being difficult. Or my people tell me that you are being difficult. Mm -hmm. I said, no, Ajay, I told him, as I'm just about to tell you, it's not going to happen on Monday morning. It can happen at any other point, but not on Monday morning. And then his response was simply that I can see you're being difficult. Okay, the meeting is not going to happen on Monday. It's now going to happen tomorrow morning, which was a Saturday morning. Mm. At 10 at my house in Saxon World. Mm. Uh, this is where he makes the comment uh, <clears throat> that he can see that I'm difficult. He's going to speak to my seniors. And he'll make sure that I'm um, sorted out. And he'll make sure that I'm replaced with people who will cooperate. Maseko implicated Jacob Zuma and Ajay Gupta. The former does not intend to cross-examine witnesses as he feels he's not implicated. The latter is keen on exploring cross-examination from Dubai via a video link. Maseko's former colleague, the acting head at Government Communication Office, Pumla Williams has made claims that former communications minister Faith Mutambi wanted to cheat the state and make the communications office dysfunctional. We lost a lot of senior people and she refused to, to fill those posts, resulting in people doubling up, people not doing certain things because they are short-staffed uh, and basically everybody was doing the bare minimum uh, because if a, a section was meant to have four people and, and three are gone, virtually that one who's remaining will try wh wh wherever is possible 
it, it, it's just not going to work. Advocate for the Commission, Vincent Maleka, has urged Deputy Chief Justice Zondo that the condition should be that those seeking to cross-examine a witness must put forward a version that can be tested. And I.J. Gupta's advocate, Mike Helens, is here to argue against just that. So which way will Deputy Chief Justice rule who gets to cross-examine whom and from where? This is advocate Mike Helens, who represents R.J. Gupta in his attempt to cross-examine Temba Maseko and Feiki Mentor's testimony. We raise in our heads the same case as my learned friends raised, Polanski, mm. who was a fugitive. The court looked, the court, mm. and, and a commission is a wider body than a court, uh, looked at, the, at, 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 at all of the factors, one way or the other, of which the fact that he was a fugitive from the Californian jurisdiction was a factor. So it is a factor, you must take it into account. So they want participation to be on their terms. Well, it could be phrased like that, um, and that might be a pejorative way, but given the reasons that they have given, they nevertheless tender participation. And if the pursuit of truth is to be aided by their participation, albeit on, uh, on the terms that they have suggested, <coughs> uh, it remains a value judgment whether you wish to conduct an inquiry unaided by the evidence or aided by the evidence, even with some rebellion in your judicious, uh, judicial soul as to whether you should accommodate such a request. It's a balancing act, mm -hmm. and, and it's one that you have to achieve. Yeah. Right. So our learned friends rely on the Polanski judgment that they and us have referenced in our heads. And no doubt you recall the stage and state of Mr. Polanski and how he sought to evade the justice of the Californian state courts, criminal courts that is, being a French person, and how he sought to utilize the legal processes of England to advance a claim for defamation. There were minority, there's a minority judgment and the majority judgment. They differ on the outcome. But all of them accept that one of the fundamental rules of authorizing video link testimony is that it must be in the best interest of the administration of justice. That principle cuts across the majority and the minority judgment. We don't find that interest of justice in this case. One can understand if you have a fugitive from justice or someone who says, I don't trust your law enforcement agents and I won't come to the country. But who says, I have evidence that will help you as a commission? For instance, a whistleblower, whose evidence is so vitally important to advance the terms of reference that you would say in that case, the evidence of that individual is in the best interest of the commission. Nothing of that sort arises in this case. And therefore, the contention of our Lenetrans doesn't call, go past base one of the rules of the commission, the terms of reference, and the commission's regulations, which always say that a witness testimony must be in the best interest of the commission. Nothing of that sort here. On the proposition of our Leonard Trent, Mr. Helens, no one has ever told them that they are a fugitive from justice. But let's deal with the issue on the face of what they have conveyed to you in the heads of argument. That they have no faith in our law enforcement processes because of their incompetence and the full might they might bring to bear on the Gupta brothers because of that incompetence. The situation is even worse on their approach because on their approach they don't trust our law enforcement processes and the trust doesn't end there. They don't trust that the judiciary would come to their assistance in case there is an abuse of law enforcement processes. And I do recall, Che, that after we had debated the Minister of Finance, Standard Bank, and other banks versus Ogbe case in Pretoria, the Ogbe group of companies represented by the Gupta brothers won that case, and they professedly 
proclaim publicly that they have a faith in the South African judicial system. Mm. What has changed in, since then? He would have to be told, Mr. Helens, is you are responsible for the decision to take yourself out of the jurisdiction of the commission. You are responsible for the situation where the commission's legal team can't interview you actually if you had come back to South Africa you may well have been granted leave to cross-examine uh, and uh, you would have been able one to uh, put before the commission as much as you could and challenge as much as you could to clear your name if, you, if one wants to put it like that and to assist the commission to find the truth but you decided to take yourself out of the jurisdiction of the commission. Yeah. Well, ultimately, the decision is yours, but that decision encompasses I, the pursuer of truth, must decide whether to deprive myself of a very useful fountain of information, which information can be tested, albeit subject to uh, 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 the limping basis, if I could call it, that you have described. If you do so, I would submit, you would never have the confidence that you'd really got to the truth. I asked uh, Mr. Helens when he was addressing me whether it was his submission that Mr. Uh, R.J. Gupta and Mr. Rajesh Gupta have a lawful reason not to come back to South Africa in relation to the business of this commission. And his answer was, he gave me what he said were his instructions. What are your submissions on that question? Chair, firstly, there is no lawful reason. All of us, all the time, face a prospect of law enforcement processes. If those prospects are well-founded, then we are subjected to the might of the law. We await to see which way Judge Zondo will rule, but from political testimonies in Johannesburg to corporate testimonies in the mother city. Steinhoff is in Parliament and we bring you the reaction to that up next. Welcome back to Political Capital, the intersection of money and politics. It was explosive from the start as members of parliament were dead set on getting answers behind one of the biggest corporate scandals in the world and definitely the biggest in South Africa. Now, billions of rands vanished with the fall of former retail colossus Steinhoff. Towards the turn of the year, auditors Deloitte announced that they cannot sign off on financial statements of the company, which in turn triggered a resignation from then-CEO Marcus Eusta, which in turn led to the collapse of the share price. What was the basis of the drop of the stand of shares, in your opinion? My personal view is that when a company does not announce its results on time, if a company has queries about accounting irregularities and after everybody expected after more than two years the outcome of the independent investigation that has already been done and suddenly they starts a new one, all confidence in a company is lost. And when that happens, the share value drop immediately like a drop. 
but that's my personal view. One of the people who you once regarded as a friend apparently referred to you as, and I quote, a fucking psychopath. You come over, frankly, a little bit like Jeff Skilling did at before Congress in the United States. Chairperson, I am not in a position to comment on the last question because I'm not aware about the statement or have ever heard it. I would like to say that I never lied about the activities of the company as the allegation was made. With respect to a WhatsApp message that you sent to colleagues um, after your resignation, you stated, and I quote, it's time to move on and take the consequences of my behavior like a man. Can you please tell me what behavior you referred to that is re that requires consequences uh, and what consequences you believe uh, bef befit the behavior displayed by yourself? The consequences that I referred to was that I have left my life of 29 years with this company that I started uh, with um, my colleagues and that it was the end of that career for me and the mistakes as I referred previously was the choice of a strategic partner that totally made that dream come true collapsed with Seifert's behavior and what happened subsequent to that. What is the value of those 68 million shares? How much did you lose personally? I have a, um, a family trust that has an investment company. And at the date of the Stein of Demise, we had, uh, through indirect holdings, 68 million uh, Stein of shares uh, at that day of the demise of the company. I had asked in rent terms. I actually said in rent terms. Then it is uh, roughly about three billion rand. First question that you refer to in terms of um, saying nothing or accept guilt, and in terms of specific answers, I can only say that I'm trying my best this morning to answer the questions to the best of my ability and to the knowledge that I have. I'm not answering questions with something in mind of whether it will incriminate me or not. In terms of the um, biggest corporate scandal, um, the biggest corporate failure in South Africa, yes. The word scandal is now the writers of sensation. And of course, it is saddened about the people that have lost money. You stated that you had never taken any short positions on Stein or Stock. So may I ask, what entities or persons that you have an interest in, business entities or persons that you have a business interest, an interest in, in whatever manner whatsoever, have taken short positions on Stein or Stock, let's say in the last two years? Uh, or in fact, let's not define it. In other words, Anything outside of your person, for instance, your family trust or businesses you may have an interest in, etc., 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 have taken short positions. In terms of any short positions, I have uh, never been part of any short positions in Steinhoff or have any interest in any companies that has. In terms of, of, of personal wealth, um, the fact that you have an impressive legal team with you indicates that... Um, your personal wealth hasn't suffered to, to any great degree um, as compared with many of the investors. I mentioned cl clearly that Mayfair is an investment company that belongs to a family trust of which I am a beneficiary. The question by the honorable member was to say that I have exposure to any financial losses in Steinhoff and I said what that company's exposure was at that time. The company was funded by loans, and those loans are in the process of being repaid. So if a company makes a loss, sell its asset and pay its loans, then the company has a financial loss. But I think uh, I'm not here to discuss uh, Mayfair's you know, matters because I don't think that there's relevance to uh, the detail of how their funding works. It's a public document. How do you explain 
the massive billion rand restatement of the financial statements uh, recently, which included reference to inflated profits, related party transactions, the incorrect application of uh, financial uh, uh, statements, and the billion, if I recall correctly, uh, restate uh, right down at Hemisphere Properties. How do you explain that? The restatement of uh, financial statements uh, that happened uh, in the half year results of Steinhoff, I've certainly had a look at that. I have no information other than what is written on those documents. Uh, what I can say is that with my knowledge of the past and what I look at there, if you buy an asset for 10 and you put it in your books for 10, at the end of the day, you must do a fair value at the end of the year to see if it needs an impairment. And that's a process that every uh, division of the group has to do at that level. It then goes to the auditors and it then gets tested at group level. I cannot comment on the write-offs of values today which I was not aware of when I was on the 4th of December still there. So I cannot comment. And once the information is published on what basis were those assets written off, then obviously I would be in a better position to reply. How did you deal with uh, Sean Holmes? Is it true that in fact you, and I think it was Len Konar who was the chairman at the time, bullied uh, analysts who reached conclusions that you found unfavorable? and threatened J.P. Morgan uh, with legal action. That's how, in fact, you dealt with your detractors. You were a bully and you went after them. Is that correct or is it incorrect? The issue about um, a J.P. Morgan research report, that is an extremely long time ago when Steinhoff was still a uh, virtually a South African-based company and a manufacturer and a sourcer. Uh, I recall, I can't recall any word in the report because it's a very long time ago. I recall that uh, it was a negative report uh, on the company. We did uh, meet with this analyst to understand what his queries was. And then through the um, facilitation of Dr. Konar, who at that stage was the chairman of Steinhoff International here in South Africa, we had a meeting uh, with his boss at J.P. Morgan to discuss with them our disagreement in some of the comments uh, that he made. And uh, I'm not aware of where I ever bullied Sean Holmes in my life, so I can't comment on that. But while Marcus Yusta was talking in Parliament, a group of investors listening to his every word and talking to the TV. He doesn't take any responsibility. Jesus. This guy is unbelievable. He yeah, like blamed everyone else. Are you impressed with the lawyers? No. He's brought one. All right. To a hearing this month. No, this is scary. Benguela fund managers hold a minority stake in ShopRite, a related company to Steinhoff, and also laid criminal charges against former CEO Marcus Yusta and his CFO Ben Lakranji. I asked the money managers if they believe Marcus really lost 3 billion rands. All, all of that was funded by the banks, or a lot of, a lot of the, the shares were actually used as uh, collateral. Mm. So uh, a lot of the losses would, be, uh, would, have, to, would have been taken by the, by the banks. Um, so I doubt that it would have been uh, his pure loss. Um, for sure, he would have lost money uh, with the share price collapsing. Mm. Um, but the, the reason to keep the share price inflated would have been, uh, or th that would have been his, his, uh, his aim in overstating uh, profits and, and uh, the balance sheet strength. Um, so I think um, he would have taken losses, no doubt about it. Um, but I don't think he expected uh, the, the, the extreme fallout that uh, did happen. Do you think that he will ever be held accountable by any of these things, considering the kinds of questions that he's being asked? Is, 
is this man being asked the right questions? Is he likely to to get away with this? Firstly, would he get away with it? It's possible. He's got an army of lawyers. It's a complicated structure or complicated fraud. I, I think it would require a long time. I mean, I think for, for us as a country, it's a disgrace to the police that Parliament gets to question markers before the courts. Mm -hmm. I think it's a disgrace. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we also understand that the police are faced with a very challenging uh, situation where they may not have all the resources to actually analyze every transaction of what happens. And I think everybody's waiting and relying on the PwC report. My only concern with that PwC report is that would it incriminate the guys who have instituted the, the investigation? It's probably unlikely. So the board might be... Uh, exonerated and uh, the blame uh, gets thrown to Ben and Marcus and maybe other uh, people but it's highly unlikely that Christopher Fisher would take any responsibility uh, Steve Boyson would take any responsibility as the chairman of the uh, audit committee and I think that is a problem I think the problem is that uh, the police are under resourced to basically conduct their own full investigation. The hope is that they'll get some information that they can then pursue further to basically get to a point where they can uh, institute criminal charges. Bottom line is that it's a very dicey situation that he could get away with it uh, if uh, the police are unable to uncover the entire truth. But I think there is sufficient uh, communication between the police and uh, and I'm saying this as somebody who laid the, uh, the criminal charges. We communicate with the police uh, uh, frequently and uh, there is like a light at the end of the tunnel. The fact is that these these cases are very tricky to to handle uh, as Willaka mentioned. Um, I mean even <clears throat> internationally I mean the US has had some uh, successes in, in you know the WorldCom and Enron <clears throat> but they are complicated and, you know, one needs experience in, in these kind of situations on how to, to approach it. Um, because, as we saw today, accountability for these things gets shifted, um, their boards, their partners. committees, mm -hmm. partners. So um, at the end of the day, it has to be a technical area that can be used to, to prosecute. There isn't any point where the investment community in particular, the fund management industry has been asked to submit what were their observations. Even if it's in retrospect that what did we miss as a fund management industry that this is what went wrong. From corporate failure to political shenanigans and disarray, the courts in South Africa are working at full speed and are more often than not the last trusted word in a country where accountability is hard to find.